you very much to all of you and uh, for inviting me to share some thoughts um, on the lines of uh, the pricing and costing of electricity. So uh, let me move on uh, with the few slides that I have to share the information I have with me with the objective of largely uh, helping uh, the audience to understand what exactly are the issues uh, behind the media attention to the electricity industry and to the petroleum industry off and on so that uh, our future interactions will be with more knowledge of the background status of the sector so i will i was uh, you know this is a standard uh, phrase that i give my students what a smart grid is uh, of course uh, digital technology uh, is used to improve reliability, security, and efficiency of an electric system from large generators through to delivery systems, uh, of course, including a growing number of distributed generation and storage resources. So that's the uh, kind of a formal definition of what a smart grid is. So I will not be uh, actually talking about a smart grid. I will be talking about more fundamental traditional things, which hopefully will contribute to uh, the development of an intelligent network, which will serve the purposes of the future. Uh, COVID or no COVID, uh, this is a requirement of the future in my view. So uh, of course, uh, it will be good for us to uh, understand what the crisis did uh, to the uh, electricity industry in 2020. So if you look at the plan prepared in 2018, the peak demand was expected to grow to 3050 megawatt by 2020. And the reported actual is 2700 megawatt last year. So of course, uh, there are certain uh, limitations in these numbers that are presented. My estimate is that possibly we would have reached about 2900 megawatt. Uh, because the distributed generation is not included in this uh, peak demand number. But what is more important and what is more important for the rupees and cents, uh, I mean the finances and the cash flow, uh, are the sales. So what I've listed here uh, are the sales forecast figures 2018 to 2020 and the actual sales up to 2020 and uh, as you see, the forecasts are generally above the actuals because uh, electricity planners are always expecting that the economy will recover next year and the demand growths will revert to the historic uh, correlations with the economic growth. So therefore, these growth figures generally represent uh, sales growth of between 6 to 7%. So, of course, what's interesting is what happened in year 2020. <clears throat> year 2020, I only have some provisional information. The information is still not available in the public domain. Being a public seminar, I would generally like to use the publicly available information. But the information, based on the information I have, I've uh, made some estimates that in 2020, the sales forecast was uh, 16,600 uh, gigawatt hour whereas the actual was 14,070. Of course, what is important is not the difference between 16,000 and 14,000, but what is important is the fact that the sales in year 2020 were lower than year 2019 by an amount of 3.6%. 3 so it's a reduction in sales, uh, which, is, which is true. Uh, I would not be able to tell you whether it will be exactly 3.6 once the official figures are published, which I expected in May, uh, in about a month's time. So that's a month in which usually uh, both the electricity utilities, LECO and CEB, publish their information for the previous year. So we will wait for that, but this would be in, the, in this range. Reduced sales required a lower electricity production. And without saying, anybody would say that reduction in uh, production was from the expensive oil burning power plants. So uh, the, the truth is that given the sad financial structure of our electricity industry and the sad 
I will say later why I say it is sad. Uh, energy mix in electricity generation, the electricity industry financial health improves if the customers do not buy electricity. You do not find that many industries that become more profitable or lesser in loss making if customers don't buy their products. So here we have, I'm talking about CB, that uh, CB will uh, probably not reach profitability, but certainly reduce the reduce the loss levels if customers reduce their electricity consumption. Why I say so is that uh, what this shows are the approved electricity costs and prices as published by the Public Utilities Commission. Of course, I will not go get into the discussions of what the roles of the commission and the utilities should be, but this is a reality. And of course, if you take a hard look at it, this is strictly against the law of the country as stipulated in the Electricity Act. Because the Electricity Act says, once the costs are reviewed and approved, prices should be equal to the costs. But as you see here, they are not equal to the cost because the horizontal red line is the average selling price. I have simplified a relatively complicated uh, cost structure. Uh, to an easily understandable uh, structure. So uh, the red horizontal line is, uh, is the average selling price of electricity, knowing that, of course, different customers pay different rates. We will come to that in a moment. And uh, each major choice of technology for electricity production, large hydropower, coal-fired generation, oil-fired generation, and renewables other than large hydro. So what, what have I done here? The green belt are the fixed costs, the costs related to investment. So they are depreciation, interest payments, and maintenance. And the gray color tiny band are the transmission costs. And the blue one is the distribution cost. And the red one is the, the red portion of the bar is the portion proportional to the electrical energy coming out of each technology. So undoubtedly, the oil fired generation is the most expensive as the tallest red bar. And the next tallest one are the other renewables. Then comes the coal fired generation. And our traditional large hydros are in fact producing and delivering because they have no financially assigned costs of uh, water. So therefore, they are producing and delivering at a price, at a cost much less than the selling price. So if we look further about this structure, uh, this is 2019 approved figures. Um, so these are, these are regulatory figures, which may not be exactly equal to the financial uh, reporting of the utilities, but they are in the correct range. So therefore, in 2019, selling large hydropower, there was a, I would say, let us say a profit of uh, 37,000 million. Selling coal fired, also there was approximately a loss of about 10 billion. Selling oil fired, 80 billion. Selling other renewables, about 8 billion. And there were some adjustments. And finally, the sector was short of about 70 billion rupees in 2019. So this was the actual situation. When, when the official accounts are published, which are not yet for 2019, the annual reports, I am quite sure that the loss reported for 2019 will be in this range. So this is the reality of the situation. And uh, having said that, and uh, since electricity prices have not been adjusted upwards, oil prices or coal prices or renewable energy prices have not come down over the last two years. This situation prevails even today. Now, if you look at things in, in greater detail, who is paying how much for electricity? This is a very uh, you know, detailed table, which comes from the Sri Lanka electricity pricing model, which we helped to develop about 10 years ago. Uh, which basically traces the quantity of electricity purchased by a certain number of customers in different consumption categories and how much is it 
how much does it cost to supply these customers and how much is the subsidy they are receiving. So it's a detailed assessment based on the professional methodology of electricity costing. So uh, of course, I can only summarize the situation. So whenever you see green here, the customer described in column one is being subsidized. When you see a, a beige color with red statistics, the customer described on the left-hand side is being surcharged. So if you look at the second table, so this table is, uh, represents the retail customers, whereas this table represents the bulk customers. So if we simply, if we let us say read, read one line, let us say MV bulk, this line, general purpose customers, these are commercial customers, World Trade Center, bank headquarters, etc. They are being surcharged to a cumulative value of about one and a half billion rupees. Uh, this data is for six months, so annually it will be about three billion. And they are paying seven rupees more than what they should be paying for electricity. So, uh, so this is how you read it. So at the end of the day, uh, there are, there are customers who are cumulatively paying about 14 billion rupees above the cost of supply. And there are other customers who are, who are being subsidized to the tune of about 40 billion rupees. So it's 43 billion to be, to be uh, closer. So therefore surcharge brings 14 billion, subsidies cost 43 billion. And this is for six months, as you see in the footnote. So therefore you subtract one from the other, multiplied by two, again, you will come to the same range of answer of about 70 billion rupees. So, so this is the further detail of, of what is going on. Electricity, of course, to low user customers, low user households, all industries, small businesses is subsidized. Now, my question is, do the customers know they are subsidized? Do you know whether you are a subsidized customer or a surcharged customer? Possibly you don't. And if you are a subsidized customer, you don't want to hear of it. Now, the question is, who finances this subsidy? In fact, I don't have an answer to that question. I only can say, give the standard answer, it is the public and the public means us. Before I move on, I will just compare the customer prices in the region very quickly. The top left shows uh, the position of Sri Lanka, the cost, sorry, the price of electricity of a customer using a moderate amount of electricity of 90 units per month. So Sri Lanka, as people erroneously say very frequently that Sri Lanka is the country with the highest electricity price. No, it is not true. You see Sri Lanka for households is much lower than many of our neighbors. On the right hand side, we have the commercial customers, uh, commercial offices, shops, uh, supermarkets, etc. in the medium category. Again, Sri Lanka is not the most expensive, but Sri Lanka is expensive, as you see. Then the bottom left is uh, the manufacturing industry. There, we cannot say Sri Lanka's manufacturing industry pays high prices for electricity. So even Maharashtra, uh, a manufacturing industry in Maharashtra in neighboring India pays about 50% more than the equivalent industry would be paying in Sri Lanka. So this is of course not considering the cost, but considering only the prices. Of course, we have a problem that the higher user households are significantly overcharged because, uh, because uh, there's an attempt to collect surcharges to help uh, finance the subsidies so of course, because of that, electricity price is in fact the talking point in many seminars because we have to accept the fact that decision makers, opinion builders, perhaps you and I, all of them are in the higher consumption bracket. So we think, in fact, for us, it is true that our electricity bill, if it exceeds about 180 kilowatt hours a month, is in fact very expensive compared with other countries in the region. And this is that comparison. So in my pool of countries in this comparison, uh, and if you are a customer using 600 kilowatt hours a month, of course, you must have an air conditioner and a few other uh, uh, energy consuming appliances to use for 600 kilowatt hour. Sri Lanka is only second to South Korea. 
all right so this is the spectrum of issues that are in hand if we ever try to do reforms to the electricity pricing structure we need to have this information monitor this information and build opinion as to how are we going to resolve this issue of large subsidies going into a large number of customers being attempted to be financed by surcharges on a few customers. One more point on this issue before I move on. Um, this graph, which I show very frequently, shows the structure of household electricity consumption. What it shows is that for several, uh, for three milestone months, the most recent is February 2020. This is household electricity consumption per month. To start with, I have to say the February 2020 bar does not go as much as 100%. And the difference is about 6.7 or so. Would you believe that 6.7% of households in this country are recording zero consumption? In fact, I was also surprised. I checked and double checked. I thought this must be uh, accounts that are inactive or houses that have been demolished, houses that were removed during tsunami. No, no. This 6.7% households are paying a fixed charge. Somebody, it's an active account. The meter is being read. A fixed charge is being paid, but the house is closed. And you will see the, the shortage uh, over, the, over the three years that are covered in this bar has been increasing. So increasing and increasing percentage of houses are closed. Anyway, that's uh, more food for thought uh, for, for a further discussion. But my focus here is that 70% of households use less than 90 units a month. Now, 90 units is nothing fantastic. Possibly this household does not, possibly does not have a refrigerator. Even if they have, it must be a small one and very sparingly used. Otherwise, they would not be able to manage with 90 and their monthly bill will be less than 860 rupees. Of course, severely subsidized. So moving on, this is what I said in the earlier, earlier slide. I will move on. What is the cost structure of electricity? Because in any business, we should be able to separate out the production cost, long distance transmission cost, the distribution costs and other financial expenses. So this is once again the information approved and published by the Public Utilities Commission. So what happens uh, once in six months is the electricity suppliers submit their costs, of course a forecast, and the Public Utilities Commission does the evaluation and then approves these costs. So this is a summary of the cost structure. Unfortunately, the latest one I can find is uh, 2019. Since 2019, we should have been publishing 2020, uh, two six months windows, as well as the first six month window for this year, and it is not being published. So uh, I think we are gradually going towards a regulatory system failure, not only, not only a power system failure, but a regulatory system failure seems to be imminent by the absence of publication of this information. Anyway, we will rely on the available information. As you see, let's look at the 2019 data. The, the fixed costs of power generation is 3 rupees 12 cents. Simply, what is the total fixed cost? Divide by the sales, it's 3 rupees 12. What is the total fuel cost of thermal power plants and the cost of energy purchases from renewables? Divide by the sales, 1392. Transmission, 83 cents. Distribution, 372. So therefore, looking at these numbers, what I have to say, and also looking at the similar numbers in other countries, is that our 1392 is significantly on the high side. We should be doing it at less than 8 rupees. And our 372 is also on the high side. So therefore, these are the two numbers internationally that are way out. And what are they? Fuel costs and renewable energy purchase costs. Then the costs of distribution. We move on. 
I will, of course, I don't have to say that the oil fired power generation is so expensive. You saw it in the, in the diagram. I don't have to re-emphasize it. Any kilowatt hour of electricity coming from an oil fired power plant is more than 25 rupees. But I thought I will highlight the costs of renewable energy because there's a, there's a common thinking that renewables are cheaper. But as you see, this is from the 2019 published information, published in great detail, plant by plant, technology by technology, in fact, month by month is published in the public domain. So see the numbers, the mini hydro fleet came at 1518, ground mounted solar 2285, biomass, sustainably grown biomass, which we call dendro power 2268, biomass from waste, 1096 and wind power 1952. So if I tell you that this electricity has to be absorbed into the grid, transmitted and distributed and marketed meters read and sold at an average price of 17 rupees, then there is a problem. Because all these power producers, small power producers put together, it's 17 rupees weighted average. And the rooftop solar is 22 rupees. And the weighted average of these two, 1740, this is, these are commercial projects, 22 rupees is from your roof, and the average price of renewable energy is 18 rupees. Then we add the fixed cost of 767, remember? Fixed costs of generation, transmission, distribution. Why do I add the generation? Because when the renewable energy power plant is not there, there has to be another power plant to take its place. So that power plant has to be maintained, uh, invested on, you know, loans paid for, and the staff have to be there. So therefore there is a shadow generation capacity cost for renewables. So when you add everything, it is 2567. So the national average selling price was 1702 in 2019. The loss is 865. And we think that renewables are very cheap, which unfortunately not. All right, so the end result of all that is that CEB as the bulk supplier, because the whole, all the profits and losses go and are, are, they get parked at a particular location. And in that location, the loss was 70 billion in 2019. And reportedly the loss last year came down to 45 billion. It is still a loss, but remember that three years, 3.6% reduction in sales, which was actually expected to be to be positive and so therefore approximately about seven percent of electricity that was to be produced was not produced so therefore the electricity production from expensive sources expensive oil sources because the renewables were not stopped but the expensive oils were stopped came down and therefore the loss has come down to 45 billion rupees last year so what's going on now on the negative side, more oil burning power plants are hired. Save for some reductions owing to COVID, more power plants are being hired. More solar PV is being purchased and signed up for 20 year agreements at 22 rupees per kilowatt hour. A, a garbage power plant was commissioned to purchase at 36 rupees per kilowatt hour. No significant progress on the gas imports or coal fired power plants. Uh, I mean, with a sense of urgency that is required uh, by uh, electricity industry in crisis. Of course, various utterances that solar will solve the problem of cost and the supply. But of course, as you see, the facts do not support that. Engineering also does not support yet uh, that solar will solve all our problems un unless and until we have adequate research to prove that and that those technologies be commercially available. Of course, on the positive side, uh, the first wind power plant was commissioned uh, late last year. Perhaps it is entering full operation around now with a levelized cost of 10 rupees, whereas some private wind power plants are still being paid rupees 25, of course, based on their contracts. Thankfully, of course, no new agreements are being signed at such high prices, but there is a significant pressure on the political authority as well as bureaucracy to, to reopen uh, these uh, uh, pricing systems, which ended up at rupees 25 for wind power. 
the topic I was asked to cover is the reliability of Sri Lanka's electricity supply. I will show you some data whether uh, to tell me whether you are happy with it or not. Of course, in my view, an electric power system has to be engineered to be reliable. It is not a case where anything goes, anything can be connected, anything can be done, any wire can be fixed. So therefore, it's somewhat different to how an electrician would wire up your house. Because he seem, he doesn't seem to know any technical uh, information, but he gets it wired up. So therefore, perhaps a lot of people in the country also think that there is no engineering required for the distribution network, for the transmission network. We can connect anything and run it any way we like. Of course, on the construction quality, I hope you do realize that the picture on the left-hand side is not Sri Lanka. And of course, the picture on the right-hand side is in Sri Lanka. So you will see the difference in quality, which should be reflected in the, in the quality of supply. But of course, I tried to get some information um, about the reliability of electricity supply in neighboring countries. I came across a difficulty about the, about the way different countries publish the information. So you will see, I've listed a number of countries on the, on the first column, and what the numbers show are the average interruption duration per customer. So which means if you are interrupted for a cumulative uh, 20 hours a year, then it's 20 into one, that is you, the customer. Maybe some customers are more frequently interrupted, others are less frequently interrupted. You take a weighted average and you get this answer. Then when I examine, oh, Sri Lanka seems to be having much higher numbers compared with India, Bangladesh, um, in fact, Indonesia as well, I don't have, uh, yes, we have Indonesia where I frequently visit. But then uh, I, I just realized that Sri Lanka is reporting all trippings, uh, whereas other countries are reporting only trippings more than five minutes. So therefore there could be a lot more outages which are within the zero to five minute interval, which uh, Sri Lanka reports one to five minute interval, whereas the other countries do not report anything below five minutes at all. So therefore we have to be careful, but it remains a fact. It remains a fact that an average CB customer, as well as increasingly an average LECO customer as well, in 2019 has experienced a total outage duration of 110 hours. 110 hours for the year. So I'm sure you do agree that it is not an acceptable situation. So therefore, this is where the smart techniques come in because our network is good. That investment has been made. The network has been very well engineered thanks to the distribution engineers who worked in CB and who worked in LECO and everybody, the academics and everybody who supported that effort in the background, the financiers, the policy makers, the governments over the last 35 years has significantly improved the distribution engineering part very particularly to bring the construction quality, the material quality, the performance to a, to a level. But still, we have this difficulty of the requirement to switch off once in two months to clear the trees touching the lines. Plus, of course, other unforeseen outages that happen in the distribution line. So there is quite a lot of work to be done here to improve the reliability of the system. Uh, reliability of electricity supply how does each source contribute to reliability? I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about how the source, I mean, the generation contribute to reliability. So as you know, uh, more and more renewables are connected to the distribution network. So when the distribution network is not, as you see, is not so reliable as the main grid. So there are additional reliability constraints coming in with renewables, small renewables. And this is the fleet of renewables we have in our system quite a large number, probably adding up to about 250 power plants, in addition to the rooftops, 250 power plants all over the network. It is more than the number of bigger power plants that we have in the system. And uh, of course, uh, probably more than 25,000 rooftop systems, maybe even 30,000. 
and uh, connected through three different mechanisms. One is called net metering, net plus, and net accounting in a different mechanism. I will not go into a lot of details, just to show you a picture of, of what happens, power flowing uh, to and fro between the system and the customer. And we need to resolve the problems with distributed generation. And that's where the smart grid, smart techniques have to come in very early. There are technical issues, there are commercial issues. So the tech from on, on the technical side, remember we had a blackout last year. We are still looking forward to receiving the final report, but that's not what I'm going to say. This blackout, this is the diagram. Uh, on the horizontal axis, it's a time. Vertical axis is the frequency. Frequency means the speed of the system, speed of rotation of the generators. So as you see, most likely this graph ends in uh, one second. So the speed of the system increased and then started going down. And at one point it went out of control and everything stopped. And everything stopped, how soon? In less than two seconds. In, loose, in less than two seconds from the first event, it was all over. Now, of course, the initiating event is, and the subsequent events are, of course, textbook cases. But the country does not have a textbook power system. And why do I say that? Because if we want a power system to be resilient, to give us a reliable supply, it must be robust and flexible. There should be redundancy. It should be smart and it should be able to recover fast. So do we have those? Of course, many of us seem to forget, even some electrical engineers forget that a power system has to be in dynamic equilibrium all the time. If you put a switch on, then some power plant has to increase its output even by a tiny amount to get your lamp to glow. But it takes five seconds for a power plant to open its valve. But your lamp glows immediately. So therefore, there has to be stored energy in the system. So if we do not have enough stored energy, then the system is weak. That's what I say in this diagram. We'll move on. So why I say the Sri Lanka system is weak and we should work towards getting it smarter and stronger because it is not smart at the moment. Although apparently, particularly if you live in Colombo, the number of hours of outage per year is about less than 10. It's very low. But that doesn't mean that everybody enjoys the same reliability elsewhere in the country. So even minor disturbances cause frequency variations. And the traditional approach is to strengthen, to raise the inertia by larger, faster generations and more reserve spinning. But of course, on this front, Sri Lanka missed the bus. Because when the rest of the world was building larger, stronger, faster generators, which are now supporting more and more renewables, Sri Lanka was building smaller and more environment friendly renewable energy power plants. Initially, Mahaveli, Kalani, Valave, and thereafter, mini hydros, wind, and solar. So, Sri Lanka is stuck to hydropower development, for, of course, for all the good reasons, but ended up with a weaker power system, which now has a lot of resistance when larger power plants are to be built. So we need to get out of this because resilience requires redundancy. So in generation, redundancy requires additional investments and additional operating costs as well. But my question is how would a bankrupt overstaffed electricity industry, which has no funds to invest, improve redundancy? So therefore, although the textbooks say that you must have so much of surplus capacity on the system, number one, there is probably no capacity available because we did not build the correct type of power plants. And secondly, even if you have the power plants to run them, to make up for the redundancy requirements, it needs money. And the operations engineer has been told very clearly your fuel budget for today is this. 
So it could very well be that we run our power system very frequently under very tight conditions. So we need to come out of this and that needs money and effort and determination. Additionally, the power distribution system is already getting stressed beyond limits, affecting customers and not CB or LECO. Not CB or LECO, but the customers are being affected. As I say, the well-engineered distribution network in Sri Lanka is entering an era of uncertain quality. Why do I say that? I'll just give you one example. This is a rooftop solar PV system. Look on the left-hand side, it's electricity output. And the fluctuations that you see, of course, cloud movements. On the right-hand side, you see the orange curve which is showing voltage values of 250 and more for several hours in the middle of the day. Sri Lanka standard legal voltage is 230. It can go 6% up, 6% down. And we have no monitoring of the network. So therefore this customer is being stressed. Of course, his solar PV output is going to the grid because probably he's not there at home. So therefore his entire output is going out. But his appliances, other appliances in the house, as well as the appliances of his neighbor, who does not have a solar PV. Uh, all of them are stressed every day for 250 volt and more. CV and LECO will not be affected, but the customers will be gradually affected. So, so when we say that uh, solar PV promoters are, are unhappy, but my thinking is that we need to study this and resolve it so that it does not become a problem at which point no more rooftops can be connected. So before we come to that, we need to resolve it. All right, so what has to be done? I've said so many things. I've exceeded my time allocation as well. For the electricity industry, we need the correct understanding of the problem. We need to leave aside the commercial interests and also leave aside the layman's view on engineering matters. Unfortunately, I have to tell that many, many times that an electric power system has to be engineered properly. And that's why the country invests on teaching and training engineers. If any one of us think that there is nothing to be engineers, engineered in an electric system, then let us not send our children to train as engineers. Let them do something else. And also a broader understanding on how other countries manage, not only the developed countries. What is India doing? How is India managing? Why is it that Tamil Nadu that had the load shedding for almost 50 years since I ever started going there, had the last load shedding in 2017 and now they are surplus? Indonesia. Philippines, which uh, both of which run financially viable electricity industries, they are developing countries. They are profit-making electricity industries. Everybody has electricity at home. They also have poor people. How do they do it? And a firm five-year plan for cost reduction, generation costs as well as a fixed cost. And of course, price increases are inevitable. If anybody says, look, we can reduce costs and make, make and resolve this problem. I would have agreed about three years ago, but not now because costs have escalated by so much, we have passed this point. So price increases are inevitable. And of course, targeting subsidies to low income customers, which is clearly stated in the energy policy as well as provision for that is there in the Electricity Act. There is no problem of providing subsidies to needy household customers as well as segments of the economy the government as a policy matter wants to support. So that's no problem provided somebody writes a check for that and it has to be transparent. And of course, distribution investments are required to, to improve reliability and to, to go towards distribution automation because after reaching 100% electricity coverage and a reasonable reliability, reasonably good quality electricity network, the next focus should be on automation with an objective of improving the reliability further. So that should be, in my view, what has to be done. 
Now, why did I show this refinery picture? Because the topic is energy. So I thought I will just put one slide on the refinery. We have a 50 year old refinery and it can now produce only 35% of the country needs. So that means 65% of our product requirements are imported. I've given the capacities. There have been many studies over the last 20 years, all of which recommended a 125,000 barrel refinery. And Sri Lanka has been trying to build a new refinery in my recollection since year 2002. So we, uh, but all the efforts have only made newspaper headlines, no refinery. Ammantota refinery, Kerala pit refinery, new refinery in Sapugaskanda. This investor has come, another investor has come, somebody laid a foundation stone as well. But my concern is as follows. We are losing, when I look at the reports, we are losing at least $400 million per year because we do not have a refinery of adequate capacity, adequate, the modern technology which is followed by the modern refineries. So therefore, we need, to, we need to get on with this project. It is an expensive project, $2,000 million. I'm sure there is a huge commercial interest to do it, but then somebody has to step in and, and structure this project in such a way that it happens without only creating newspaper headlines. So finally, this is my last slide. Sri Lanka is notoriously unable to sort out issues, think and work strategically with a very clear focus. We see it in many sectors and we see it in the electricity industry as well. So the problems in my view, of course, people have many ideas. No need to build big power plants. Small power plants are beautiful. And I have to say, no, everything has to work together to produce electricity at the correct quality and the correct price and with the correct contribution to sustainability. Refineries are not required because future transport will be electric. It's easy to say, we can quote even various other country announcements about uh, diesel cars being phased out after 2040. But then we need to resolve our problem and we have to use the technology that is available in hand. Renewable energy is cheap. I'm sure you have heard this. And I've shown you the data from published information. Renewable energy is not cheap. Sri Lanka has no experience in gas imports and handling. So therefore, Sri Lanka should not be importing gas. Electricity can be produced from sea waves. The country is surrounded by sea. So the same slogan that is repeated for fish is being reported for waves. But wave experts tell me that it will be at least another 10 years that they have a commercially viable wave power plant. True, there are some pilot power plants elsewhere in the world. CB and CPC are service organizations. There is no need for profits. But then, soon thereafter, the secretary of the president said recently, there are two monsters that eat up all our manufacturing and tea export income. And he even gave the figure of uh, something like $5,000 million uh, per year for energy imports. Of course, everybody is asking more subsidies, free electricity, free solar panels, subsidies for solar panels, and more uh, pricing for renewables. But nobody is seriously talking about who pays for it. Because neighboring India, most of the utilities are gradually moving towards profitability. They have their targets. They do give some subsidies, but they have their targets. In five years' time, we'll get there. In five years' time, we'll get there. The subsidy will not be more than X percent of the cost. So like that, gradually moving towards targets, whereas we seem to be uh, not having any target. So with all this, we cannot save the entire 5,000 million, the secretary said, but we have a potential saving of 1,000 million, uh, sorry, million dollars a year. Sorry, I put the, forgot the uh, term million, 1,000 million US dollars per year is the potential saving. If we do this right, with, with increased reliability and, uh, and the profit making, and there are limits to profit, electric utilities, and uh, fully, uh, fully sized refinery for Sri Lanka. That's the end of my presentation and thank you very much.